everyone on this the sixth Sunday of Easter. Glad to have you all here. Let's go ahead and begin. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. In the name of heaven and earth. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. O oh, Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a the poor, miserable sinner, confess, confess unto you all, all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you, you, and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them, and I pray you of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you, and in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Forever, O oh Lord, your word is firmly fixed in the heavens. Your faithfulness endures to all generations. You have established the earth and it stands fast. By your appointment, they stand this day. For all things are your servants. If your law had not been my delight, I would have perished in my affliction. I will never forget your precepts. For by them that you have given me love, glory be to the glory Father, be to the Father and, and to the, the Son, and, and to the Holy Spirit, Spirit as it was in the beginning, beginning is now, now and, and will be forever. forever. Amen. Amen. Your word is a lamp to my feet. And a light to my path. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. We pray. O oh God, the giver of all that is good, by your holy inspiration, grant that we may think those things that are right, and by your merciful guiding, accomplish them. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Mm -hmm. Our first reading is from the book of Acts, chapter 17. Now, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons, and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting, for you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. 
and he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God, and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Christ is risen from the dead. God the Father has crowned him with glory and honor. He has given him dominion over the works of his hands. He has put all things under his feet. The epistle is from 1 Peter chapter 3. Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should, offer, if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey, when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. This is the word of the Lord. Alleluia. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. Alleluia. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 16th chapter. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. Yet a little while and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. In that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him, and manifest myself to him. This is the gospel of our Lord. We join together in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. 
Our text this morning is from the book of Lamentations, chapter 3. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man that he bear the yoke in his youth. Let him sit alone in silence when it is laid on him. Let him put his mouth in the dust. There may yet be hope. Let him give his cheek to the one who strikes, and let him be filled with insults. For the Lord will not cast off forever. But though he cause grief, he will have compassion according to the abundance of his steadfast love. For he does not afflict from his heart or grieve the children of man. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The book of Lamentations begins with the prophet Jeremiah speaking as the personification of the people of Israel, as he bemoans to God and all who could hear the weight of their suffering. But in our text this morning, he changes over to his own voice, that of one who is personally enduring suffering, and suffering is always personal. Even the synonyms of lament speak volumes, bemoan, grieve, mourn, complain, regret, deplore, and deeply felt action verbs, bemoan, oh, did those, moaning, wailing, keening, crying, is the cry to God of a people in their affliction that knows this is God's discipline, and discipline is always unpleasant. Once more today, we are reminded that God does not send the evil into the world, but he uses it to teach us. But when will this particular lesson be over for Israel? As the world today strives to return to some new definition of routine, we're asking ourselves and God the same exact question. When will the threat of this disease be over? When will our lives get back on track? which we were perfectly content with before, or at least mostly satisfied with. We implore to God with the psalmists and the prophets who said, how long, O Lord? The entire book of Lamentations is full of sadness over suffering and the tragedies which caused it. The suffering is deserved, though you and I do not ordinarily think of it that way. But how often do we stop and discuss how we are to endure suffering? There are a lot of self-help books out there and a lot of sermons that'll try to give you a checklist to follow to ensure that God will smile on you again. Now, while John Ritter and Katie Seagal may have had eight simple rules, God doesn't give us that. What God does provide when we enter into a period of suffering is an attitude adjustment and a growth in understanding. It doesn't matter if it's a prolonged illness or the isolation that comes from this social distancing or guilt over a particular sin with which we suffer and struggle. And it doesn't matter if it's brought on by faithless leaders or faulty planning or even our own genetic predis predisposition. It doesn't matter if it's financial strain that we find ourselves in, or the difficulty we have at work despite giving it our best effort, or that makes no difference if we suffer in sympathy with friends or family who are having surgery for heart disease or radiation treatment for cancer. They may all send us into the kind of despair that the Israelites display in Lamentations. We may even suffer a crisis of faith and a loss of hope. There's some among us here today who are suffering several of those things all at once. And again, we cry, how long, O Lord? And God replies as if to a child, 
wondering when the car ride will finally be over. Just wait quietly. God will teach each one of us how to respond to suffering and how to respond to him. And as in our time of trial, we learn to wait patiently and quietly for the good that God has in store for us. And as we quiet our minds and start to listen, God has three declarations to proclaim to us about himself. And he will declare three things that are good for us. And he will make three appeals to our future behavior. Maybe he does give us lists. First, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. The true nature of God is loving kindness, the kindness or affectionate behavior that results from an expression of love. And God is always true to his nature. Second, God's compassion is unending but it appears to us to be so. As Jeremiah says to the Lord, as if they are new every morning, great is your faithfulness. And third, the Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. God is the meaning of our existence. That is what makes us valuable in his eyes. These three properties of God, if you want to call them that, lead us to find him and find in him those three good qualities and encouragement for ourselves to try to emulate and follow them. So as we now quietly try to still our anxious hearts and minds, we begin to hear that the Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul that seeks him. To the waiting ones, God bestows every good thing. And secondly, it is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Those who belong to him wait on his coming to us. Those who wait quietly have humbled themselves before God, which is the attitude we should hold when we trust him. And we have faith that those who belong to him live in his mercy and grace. What are we waiting on God for? Are we waiting for him to blow the viruses out into space? To reach into the lungs of those who can't breathe and heal those swollen infected tissues? Yeah, God can do those things if it's his will. He can use the doctors to treat us. Sometimes he can even quietly work a miracle cure. Are we waiting on God to give us the money we need to make us forget we're unhappy? Are we waiting for him to strike down on those that have wronged us? Sometimes we don't wait quietly or patiently. And frequently, that loud and important waiting is waiting for all the wrong kind of things. Or wishing that God would drop that easy solution in our laps. But the one thing needful that we do wait quietly for is salvation. Salvation from the hurts and sorrows of this life, yes, but ultimately deliverance from eternal death into the life everlasting in heaven with him and those who are already there whose suffering is now over. And finally, it is good for a man that he bear his yoke in his youth. It's good to learn early in life that waiting quietly is good. Those of us who are still a little wet behind the ears are unquestionably blessed to have so many among us that have learned that life lesson already, often the hard way, and can be an example to us. Because the younger you are, the more you can bend before you break. And the sooner we learn the value of waiting quietly, the more that lesson will stick and the stronger our faith will be for it. The Lord God gave Jeremiah three exhortations to proclaim to those who only belong to the Lord. And they tell us how to live this life of faith, that which God grants to those who quietly wait. The reason we are waiting quietly in our suffering is that God allows it. 
There is nothing in this universe that is outside of God's notice or his control. And since even our pain is under his command, let us wait patiently as God brings us the help and the healing for which we pray to be done in his good time and according to his good pleasure. Let us shut our mouths as well as that inner voice as our method of silent patience. We should be a living example of a very godly trait. It's called forbearance. If you say that someone has shown forbearance, you admire them for behaving in a calm and sensible way about something they have every right to be upset or angry about. Jeremiah says of the one whose trust is in the Lord, let him sit alone in silence when it is laid on him. Let him put his mouth in the dust. There may yet be hope. God wants us to behave calm and sensibly, not upset or angry with him, because there is an infinite difference between ourselves, who are sinners, and the one truly sinless one. We should bow down so far and so meekly in our suffering that the dust of the ground enters our mouths and silences our sinful tongues. Because it is our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who is truly the living example of forbearance. In bearing the sins of the world, Jesus could have well yelled at his Father in his pain and in his passion, yet he opened not his mouth and he gave his cheek to the one who strikes and let him be filled with insults. It is Christ who bore the reproach of the Father. He endured the disappointment, the anger, and the punishment that belonged to you and I. The reproach was withstood for one reason alone, his enduring and steadfast love for each one of you. To suffer as a Christian is to remind us that we already possess the salvation that Christ won for us by his suffering. For the Lord will not cast off forever, but though he cause grief, he will have compassion according to the abundance of his steadfast love. For he does not afflict from his heart or grieve the children of men. Waiting's not something we enjoy. And it's made more difficult still when our suffering is to be endured in silence. But the word of the Lord endures forever. And in it we see revealed how beautifully God has already given us what we are really waiting for. The promise won by Christ's suffering and death on the cross. To each of you who endure your suffering by quiet waiting, he promises that the affliction of pain and distress is only temporary, an occasion needed for our learning and our benefit. And he promises that he will always act according to his nature, according to his steadfast love and infinite compassion, his quality of loving forgiveness of sins for the sake of Christ. We then can learn how to rejoice in suffering and do so gratefully patience, endurance, and afflictions, knowing that their duration is limited and which has no comparison to the joy of heaven, free from suffering, pain, and sorrow. And for that we thank God, in the name of Jesus, amen. May the peace which passes all understanding guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, amen. pray. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. O Lord, we pray for the faithful proclamation of Jesus Christ to those who do not know him, that through hearing the word of the Lord, many may be brought to faith and to the knowledge of the truth. O Lord, we pray for the church of God here and everywhere, that all who confess Jesus Christ may be united in doctrine and witness defended against all the assaults of the enemy, and eager to gather around your word and sacraments in love for one another. O Lord, we pray for our parish, for the work of the kingdom in our community, 
and for the resources to accomplish all that God desires, that his name may be glorified among us and his purpose fulfilled in our words and works. O Lord, we pray for the agencies and institutions through which we love our neighbor and provide for those in need, for the destitute and homeless, and for everyone who suffers unemployment and underemployment, that we may aid them in their needs and assist them to find honorable labor to supply all their needs. O Lord, we pray for the lonely who suffer the burdens of life without friendship or family, for those depressed or weary of pandemic measures, and for the fellowship of the church, that we may bear one another's burdens and live in community with Christ as our head. Lord, we pray for the sick and those who suffer. We especially pray for the family of Roger Freeman who passed away earlier this week, and we most especially lift up Heather to you. We lift up Alex and all those who are homebound or who are not well or confident enough to venture out to rejoin us. We pray for them and we pray for their safe return to church. And we pray for Elena, who must undergo throat surgery again this Friday. We pray that God would grant healing to their bodies, peace for their minds, and consolation in their grief and sorrows. O Lord, we pray for love of godly things, that we may delight in God's word and walk in his ways, and for the spirit, that we may be led into all truth and kept from error and false doctrine. O Lord, we pray for the nation, for those who lead our nation, for the end of the pandemic, for peace among nations, and for an end to terror and violence, that we may work for the common good, so that justice may prevail, life be protected, and truth abound. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord, our God, we pray to you to strengthen our faith and to make our hearts whole, that we may not fear but address our prayers to you in all humility. Hear us on behalf of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, as he has taught us. Our, Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Have a blessed week.